The title of my presentation is uh, Scalar Particles and Discourse Structure. Uh, this is very much <clears throat> still an ongoing project that um, uh, that still lacks lots of details, but I, I wish to present some of the gists, the, the core ideas, um, so that you uh, you know uh, like the the rough uh, um, the shape and, and, and ideas of, of this project. Okay, um, I will start um, with some basic facts about the, the two uh, scalar particles in Mandarin, which is Do and Jiu. <clears throat> so it is well known. <clears throat> that um, Do is a scalar or quantificational particle with multiple meanings or uses. So in 1A, um, 他们都会说日语, uh, they can all speak Japanese. In this case, Do is like all. And then in 1B, um, Lin Amin uh, even Amin can speak Japanese. That's the case where Do seems to be like even. <clears throat> also well known is the scalarity of another particle um, that is Jiu, uh, as in two. Amin Jiu Hui Shuo Ri. So in this case, Jiu is like a, uh, a, a marker for low ranking on some kind of scale. And then here is the translation uh, <clears throat> adapted by uh, from uh, Liu Mingming's work. Uh, Amin, who is easy to get hold of, can speak Japanese. Right? Amin Jiu Hui Shuo Ri. And this infers that there is no need to get someone else who can speak Japanese. Okay. Um, <clears throat> each of these particles uh, is subject to the locus of much discussion. And so there is a, a certainly um, a respectable uh, a, amount of, of literature on each particle. Um, there are many, many on Do, and there is also many on Zhou, uh, including uh, some of uh, Dr. Papin Ali's uh, own work. Now, my talk will concentrate on the relation between the two particles and discourse structure in the sense of Buring um, and Robert's work. In particular, how the, uh, <clears throat> the discourse structure, the analysis of discourse structure can help to, to derive the meaning of um, the particles. Okay, So that's a, a discourse-based uh, approach to scalar particles. Yeah, here's a roadmap. Um, I will first of all um, introduce some basic characterizations of both uh, do and of certain do and Joe sentences. <clears throat> certain here because uh, I will not, of course, discuss all kinds of do and Joe sentences, but instead I will focus on, on the kind of data that, that have been introduced in the beginning. And second, um, I will lay out the, the uh, some of the fundamental ingredients in the QUD-based model of discourse and information structure um, based on Roberts 2012. And then I'll take a detour um, to introduce the uh, the concept of contrasted topics based on Beering 2003, uh, which is very important to the analysis that I'm going to propose. And, and finally, I will go to Do, uh, which uh, will be argued as a quantifier over discourse sub questions. Okay, and then uh, I'll show how this can be extended to the low rank Zhou. <clears throat> so um, syntactically, <laughs> Zhou is sorry, Do is associated with something um, to its left, and that's <clears throat> something that is widely known in the literature. And um, if the associate is an object phrase, <clears throat> then this would result in overt movement. Um, so um, in, in 3A, Zhang Aming, uh, right? So you see uh, movement of the object phrase to the preverbal position. Uh, the same in the Lian Do construction, like, where Aming occurs in the preverbal position. And then <clears throat> these sentences would be ungrammatical if you put the object in the uh, proposed verbal position, as in C um, and in D. The same pattern holds for Zhou, uh, which signals low rank, but then uh, there are other restrictions on the predicate. So for example, uh, you can say uh, for A, uh, and then you can follow by right? <clears throat> he couldn't um, finish as few as one book, um, let alone three. Now in this case, the uh, the positive counterpart uh, is ungrammatical. So is bad. So 4B is bad, right? So for some reason, the form of the, 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 uh, the predicate matters for the judgment. <laughs> An obvious question uh, is what may be the semantic effect of overt movement that is common to these, that is common to these scalar particles and maybe a few others too, <clears throat> right? Um, second, Do has semantic multifunctionality. Once again, this has been known uh, for quite some time, 
um, that <clears throat> do uh, can sometimes mean all, can, it can sometimes mean even. So I repeat the, the examples right here. Um, they can all speak Japanese or even um, can speak Japanese, right? So the, it's it's well known that do can you know uh, 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 alternate between these two meanings among others. <clears throat> now these two meanings, all and even, are clearly both related to the universal force. Um, so, for example, one B, um, implies that at least someone else can also speak Japanese. Okay. <clears throat> However, um, this is not always the case, um, <clears throat> as observed by uh, Liu Mingming in his recent talk. Right. So, here's a context: um, a group of elementary school kids are on a field trip, and the creek is on their way. Aming, who is the youngest and shortest kid, leaped over the creek. The teacher wants to encourage all other kids and said, Lian Aming do tiao guo chu le, ni men ye ke yi de. Right, so this is something from the, the teacher and he, she, who, who tries to encourage other kids to, to leap over. Right, so even um, um, uh, the translation is something like even Aming um, leaped over, and you can too, right? But then it's different from English in the sense that um, <clears throat> there is no uh, additivity in inferred, right? So in this context, there is only one kid um, named the Aming who has leaped over. And so uh, there is no additivity that someone else also leaped over. But then uh, the sentence in five is felicitous in this context. And so that means um, while it's, intu it's uh, intuitively plausible to say that the even type Do has universal quantification, it does not really quantify over individuals in the same way as the universal Do does. <clears throat> and this shows that the two kinds of Do are uh, still different um, in some fundamental way. So they're very similar, but they're also different. <clears throat> and third, um, Jiu also has semantic multifunctionality. So once again, this has been known from the literature that it can convey scalar lowness as well as Temporal earliness and sufficiency. Right? So <clears throat> in 6a, uh, Aming Jiuhui Shuo Ryu, right? So uh, Aming, who is easy to get hold, hold of, can speak Japanese. And then you can also say Aming Xing Qi Yi Jiu Lai. In 6b, Aming came as early as Monday, and which implies that he did not come later than Monday. Okay, so it's like Monday is early, uh, earlier than expected. <clears throat> That's what we, we mean by uh, temporal earliness here. Okay. Uh, and in 6C, uh, Jiu can also indicate sufficiency, conditional sufficiency. So um, you go, I go, right? 你去我就去, uh, which implies that for me to go does not require more than uh, you're going. Um, so intuitively, there is something in common among all these uses, but it's not easy to explain what it is. It's not easy to explain what the commonality is, <clears throat> let alone derive their meanings. Right? So that's something that we're going to discuss um, later on. Now, the gist of the, the proposal um, goes as follows. Okay? Uh, the, the Mandarin particle, though, reflects a sub-question-based discourse structure, <clears throat> where the goal of answering a question under discussion, or QUD, is achieved by addressing its sub-questions. Okay? And second, there is a semantic or a pragmatic explanation for the syntactic movement associated with though. So that's a it's going to be an approach that can offer a rationale for why there is syntactic movement in the sentence uh, with Do and with Zhou. <clears throat> and third, um, Do is related to universal quantification. Uh, that is uh, the same as what many previous studies have proposed. But here, um, the domain of quantification is different from what previous studies um, propose. Um, and so previous studies, um, many of them um, have said that Do quantifies over individuals or over propositions. But in, I'm going to say that Do actually quantifies over discourse sub-questions, but not propositions. And finally, the low rank Zhou also operates on sub-questions, but it imposes a different restrictions, different from Do, how the sub-questions should be answered. Okay. Um, so here is a few uh, key fundamental ingredients in a model of discourse structure and information structure <clears throat> built uh, uh, based on Roberts 2012. So first of all, discourse is organized around series of con conversational goals and the strategies of inquiry, <clears throat> which discourse participants develop to achieve them. 
Okay, so what is a discourse? Um, it has a goal where the uh, discourse participants uh, try to achieve, and then they take different strategies of inquiry to achieve that goal. Now, what goal? The goal is to find out the way things are and share information with other participants, right? <clears throat> so basically, they want to find out like what the world is like. And then there are two kinds of moves <clears throat> to achieve the goals. Uh, one is to ask questions. And the other is to answer the questions, um, which take the form of, of assertions, right? So in this framework, <clears throat> you either have questions or you have assertions that are answers to the questions. So questions and assertions are the two kinds of moves that can help uh, that the discourse participants take to achieve the goal. <clears throat> and the QUD question under discussion is a question that is accepted by the discourse participants and becomes the immediate topic of discussion. <clears throat> so a, a QUD is something that all the discourse participants are interested in. Uh, they all try to, to uh, the goal, the common goal is try to solve the QUD, to resolve the QUD with a complete answer. And then they can uh, resolve the QUD with a complete answer through different ways to through different strategies of inquiry, which refer to sequences of questions designed to satisfy the goal. Okay, so what does strategy of inquiry means? It means something like this, right? So here's a quick example from, um, um, from Robert's work. Suppose we are dealing with a big question, uh, who ate what? Right? So we're, 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 we want to know uh, among a group of people and among, among a group of things, who ate what? Uh, and then we can uh, divide the big question into different sub questions and then different sub questions among larger sub questions. So who ate what? It can be divided into what did John eat in A and what did Mary eat in B? <clears throat> um, and then for what did John eat? It can be further divided into two sub questions. Did John eat bagels? Did John eat tofu? Right? Um, did Mary eat bagels? Did Mary eat tofu? And then the, the, the individual answers to individual sub-questions, uh, the combination of them would be the complete answer to the big question, who ate what, right? So this is what the discourse, uh, what we mean by discourse structure, right? So the, the entire discourse is guided by uh, a, a big question, the, the main, the large QUD. And then any participant can, can take a particular strategy of inquiry in order to resolve the QUD, to provide the complete answer. So given this um, hierarchical organization of um, discourse, we can talk about entailment that is based on questions, but not based on propositions. So, <clears throat> so what this the, the box below here means is essentially that um, a higher question entails a lower question, right? So something like who ate what entails what did John eat? And then what did John eat also entails, did John eat bagels and did John eat tofu, right? So this kind of entailment, um, <clears throat> I will not make use of this in my analysis, but then this is something that, that is quite essential uh, in this kind of framework, because this is uh, this provides a, a very concrete way to, to talk about the hierarchical relation among different uh, lay layers of questions. A question Q1 entails another question Q2, if and only if every complete answer to the first question is also a complete answer to the second question. So for example, the complete answer to who ate what to the big question. Um, for example, John ate bagels and tofu and Mary only ate bagels, right? So this complete answer to the big question, of course, also uh, completely answers uh, each of the sub questions in here. And so who ate what entails all other sub questions, okay? Um, <clears throat> so in terms of Bering's D tree discourse tree diagram, uh, this can be visualized in this way, which is a very, very nice way of understanding uh, the uh, question-based discourse structure. So the one on the top node is the big question, who ate what, right? And then they can be split into different sub questions. What did John eat? What did Mary eat? What did other people eat? And then to solve this sub question, we can further ask, use we can uh, further use polar questions like did Johnny bagels, did Johnny tofu, and then answer these questions by yes or no, um, and then we collect all the answers to these sub questions, and then we get the final answer for this for the, the major 
um, the question in, in, in the root node, okay, All right? And so uh, the node, the question on the top entails all the questions that it dominates. So in terms of the syntactic terms, uh, we can say that who ate what um, will entail all the questions that it dominates, right? And then, for example, what did Zhang eat also entails the questions that it dominates, okay? Now, um, this, uh, uh, this uh, sorry, this sub-question based discourse framework uh, also provides a very nice way uh, for different notions of information structure, for example, focus and contrasted topic, CT, right? Um, for example, if we ate, if we ask what did jump sorry what did Fred eat, and then by uh, the, uh, the standard typical following intonation, Fred ate the beans, right? Following intonation, <clears throat> this provides a complete answer uh, to this question to a uh, with beans uh, marked by focus, so it's F F marked. Now, um, in the case of Nai, what did what about Fred? What did he eat? And then if you read 9A, 9A uh, the answer <clears throat> with a four rise intonation on Fred, so something like Fred ate the beans, right? So in, in contrast to A, when in which you would say Fred ate the beans, the following intonation. If you uh, attach the four rise intonation to Fred, like Fred ate the beans, the understanding is that it is actually just a partial answer to an overarching uh, big question, right? Fred ate the beans. And then if you just stop here, then, then you know, the someone else might ask, then what about what about Mary? What about John? What about others? And so this implies that someone else ate something else. Um, and then that is a uh, the standard a function of a CT that it evokes something else, someone else about Fred. Okay. <clears throat> so in English, uh, in English, CT marking, contrastive topic marking using the full rise intonation indicates that there is at least one alternative relevant to current context, okay? Um, Bjorn defines a new dimension of meaning, uh, which is called CT value, uh, which is, sent, is essentially a set of sub questions. <clears throat> so Fred, Fred ate the beans. So the sentence um, with both F marking and CT marking has an ordinary value, which is just the assertion, Fred ate the beans. It has the focus semantic value um, in root sense, uh, which is a set of propositions. So Fred and the beans, Fred the bagels, right? So you just replace um, beans with uh, relevant alternatives. Now, the, uh, the uh, innovative idea of Buring's work is that there is the third layer of meaning that is called CT value, <clears throat> which is a set of questions, a set of questions um, which can be derived by replacing Fred with other alternatives, right? Uh, and so that's a that's a, a new dimension of meaning um, in the presence of a CT. So the ordinary semantic value is an answer to just one sub question in the CT value. So that means 10A is just one sub question in the activated CT value in 10C. Okay, so uh, we're dealing now we're dealing with the uh, the super question like who ate what, right? And then the marking of CT on Fred indicates that there is a set of sub-questions. What did Zhang eat? What did Mary eat? What did other people eat? There's a set of sub-questions. And then the ordinary value, the ordinary value of this sentence uh, is just an answer to one of these questions. <clears throat> so this explains why uh, when we say Fred ate the beans, seems to suggest that there is someone else who ate something. It seems to be incomplete in, in, in a sense. And that's really because there is a set of sub questions activated, but then the assertion only responds to one of them. So there are other questions that have not been answered. Okay. All right. Um, and I'm going to uh, probably skip due to the, the limit of time, I'll skip the city value formation. Uh, it's just uh, a more specific mechanism to derive a uh, set of sub questions. But then the idea is very simple city marking in English derives a set of sub questions. Um, uh, which all together um, form a strategy together with the, the super question, okay? 
Now back to Mandarin. Uh, in Mandarin, fronted objects tend to give rise to incompleteness, <clears throat> if not followed by a contrastive clause. Okay, and this the kind of data has been observed by also by early studies. <clears throat> For example, if we were asking what did Amin eat, and then we can say "他吃了猪肉," right? So that's uh, we have focus marking on "猪肉" and then it's complete, right? So it can be a complete answer. But then if you front the pork, if you front the object to the either the beginning or a, uh, a position between the subject and the predicate, 猪肉他吃了, or 他猪肉吃了, they both sound incomplete uh, in this context where we're trying to answer the question, what did Amin eat, right? <clears throat> but then if you say 14D, uh, then it's perfect, it's just perfect. So um, syntactic movement seems, to, seems closely related to the CT-based uh, discourse structure, okay? Um, the idea is that whenever the uh, object is proposed uh, together with the, maybe with the CT intonation, which is stress in Mandarin, um, we're looking at this kind of discourse structure uh, where we're trying to answer the big question, what did, what did I mean eat by raising a, sub of, a set of sub questions and then answer these sub questions, right? So, Zhuro Tachila. Zhuro Tachila activates the set of uh, sub questions in here, and it is the positive answer to just one of them, right? So, if you say Zhuro Tachila, then just stop there. <clears throat> it sounds incomplete because there is another, at least one other sub question that you have not answered. So the analysis in brief, uh, which I will come to show you momentarily, is that syntactic movement is a mechanism to derive a polar question. Okay, so <clears throat> he ate pork becomes, did he eat pork? CT marking activates a CT value, which is a set of polar questions out of the previous, previously formed polar question, right? So that's a set of polar questions. <clears throat> and finally, each clause with a CT represents an answer to a polar question, okay? Um, and more specifically, I'm going to adopt uh, an, a very, very specific ingredient from Noah Constant's dissertation on contrastive topic. So the uh, the logical form or the uh, the LF okay, of uh, the sentence uh, looks like this or right in fifteen. So there is a lambda operator in here on top of uh, the this clause, and then there is movement. Uh, in here, we're talking about overt movement of the object. Okay, so this, uh, in a way, this is uh, the same as standard lambda abstraction. This is the mechanism of lambda abstraction, which involves the insertion of the lambda and then movement. Okay, but then here, this lambda is a specifically um, defined for a uh, contrastive topic. It functions to generate um, a set out of a set. Uh, based on the proposition, okay? So uh, in the note, in note one, uh, the denotation is just he ate uh, like X, which is about variable, okay? And then this CT operator finds this variable and then it generates a singleton set that contains a singleton set of propositions. And then this denotation in here is very important, okay, for two, um, because this is um, the kind of lambda operator that allows us to generate a set out of the set, uh, which eventually, when it combines with the CT, the contrastive topic, can generate a set of sub questions. So here, one um, key assumption is that the denotation of a polar question, like like is it P or something like that, <clears throat> is a singleton set, right? So the polar the a polar question, uh, the denotation of that is is not P and not P, but rather it's just P, it's a singleton. Okay, so, so on this definition, um, the set of sets of proposition is just the set of polar questions. Okay, so we, <clears throat> we uh, formally we need the CT operator to derive a set of polar questions. Um, <clears throat> so back to the first part of 14D, uh, okay, it has the LF in here. Its assertion is simply that he ate pork, but then it activates the CT value, which is the set of polar questions. Did he eat pork? Did he eat beef? Okay. Um, so some consequences um, include, first of all, incompleteness is derived because the assertion 
uh, PA port only addresses one question in the CT value. And there are other questions that have not been addressed. So it, it's perceived as incomplete. <clears throat> and second, we will have to assume that the CT meanings of in, uh, in Mandarin can only be derived through movement as triggered by the CT operator because only when movement occurs do we get the CT interpretation. Okay, so once again, movement is crucial because it is the mechanism that derives a polar question denotation. Okay, so now turning to Do, finally, I propose that um, just like the CT operator, the Do, uh, I'm talking about the universal one, okay, uh, triggers a set of polar questions and it additionally imposes the requirement that every question be positive answer. So that's the that's the main idea, right? So the D, D tree, the discourse tree uh, of 1A, 他们都会说日, is given in 17, in here in the box. Um, so here we are trying to answer the uh, big question, who can speak Japanese? And then Do indicates that this big question is split into different sub-questions, different polar questions. <clears throat> can Ami speak Japanese? Can Ami speak Japanese? Can Aq speak Japanese? And then Do says, every sub-question has a positive answer. So Ami can speak Japanese. Ami can speak Japanese, Aki can speak Japanese, right? So in other words, everyone can speak Japanese, but then we derived this result by individually answering each sub-question positively. Um, so in other words, the universal dose signals is sub-question-based discourse structure in which multiple sub-questions are answered and answered in the same way in order to resolve a larger QUD. Okay, um, there is at least one supporting case for this um, approach. When each sub-question is explicitly answered positively, the universal DOE is not licensed in a follow-up confirmation question. So, so if I say, Ami, um, in 18A, Ami, Ami, he Aq, ma, right? Can Ami, Ami, and Aq speak Japanese? And then if the other person answers, Ami, hui shuo ri, Ami, hui shuo ri, Aq, yi, hui shuo ri, Right, so Ami can speak Japanese, Ami can speak Japanese, Aq can also speak Japanese. In this case, the first speaker cannot continue to ask, right? So it's infelicitous to ask this kind of confirmation question. The, intu the intuition is that there is nothing to confirm, okay? So once um, every sub-question is brought up and then answer, though is not licensed. Now contrast this with um, another scenario. If the question is um, again, can Ami, Aq, Ami and Aq speak Japanese? And then another person answers, yes, they can. Okay, and then in this scenario, you can continue to and to, to ask in 19C, right? Ami, Ami and Aq And then you can continue to ask, Right, so in this case, Do is licensed. It's licensed when the sub-questions are not explicitly addressed individually, okay? The reason is simply that those function of universally quantifying over these sub-questions remains informative, okay? <clears throat> so this provides um, at least some kind of support to this approach that Do really quantifies over sub-questions. So if all the sub-questions have been brought up and then addressed, then Do cannot be used uh, in a follow-up confirmation question. <clears throat> However, notice that uh, 19B already completely answers the question 19A, right? So if I if you ask, uh, and then you say, 他们会啊? 19B alone <clears throat> implies the universal quantification that all of them can, right? So the question is, why is Do licensed in 19C? Uh, why can we still use Do in here if Do is universal quantifier, right? Uh, so the, the, the <clears throat> in other words, the question is, 19B, the answer 19B also provides the answer that all of them can speak Japanese. But why can you still use Do if Do is universal quantification? <clears throat> the intuition is that um, the speaker, the first speaker, uh, uses 19C <clears throat> to convey a doubt or some kind of uncertainty, uh, which is that given what the speaker knows, perhaps one or more of the three individuals cannot speak Japanese. Okay, so that's kind of a doubt <clears throat> or uncertainty uh, behind the use of Do. For example, 
Ami and Ami are Japanese majors, but Aq is a French major. And a typical French major does not speak Japanese based on you know, whatever stereotypical impressions that, that one has. <clears throat> and so the question 19c can be paraphrased as follows. Is it the case that if I inquire about the individuals one by one, the answers to these sub-questions are still all positive? Okay. So those discourse structures related to this doubt, um, if I check the individuals one by one, <clears throat> if I answer the sub-questions one by one, perhaps there will be a negative answer uh, based on uh, relevant knowledge that I have. So though the universal though in 19C uh, signals that all sub-questions are positively answered, right? So that's its assertion. It says, whatever sub-questions that there is, they are positively answered. The answer is, oh yes. Even though there is some doubt to one or more of the positive answer, even though I have some doubt, I still want to say every sub-question has a positive answer. So that licenses the use of though because <clears throat> um, the, 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 the context or the conversational background in the use of though is different from the question in 19a. So the D tree of 1a, uh, is revised as um, in 21. So it is basically the same as the previous tree, except that in here, um, can you speak Japanese, given that he is a French major? is incorporated into the sub-question. And so the yes, the positive answer to the sub-question is a positive answer to one, to a sub-question that expresses some kind of doubt. So it's, in other words, it's like the answer is yes, 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 even though one sub-question might have a negative answer because a French major probably does not speak um, Japanese, but still he can, right? Um, so the contribution of Do, the universal Do, is threefold. Um, first, it activates a set of sub-questions through movement. Second, it requires that every sub-question be positively answered. Okay? And third, <clears throat> it requires that there be some doubt to the positive answer to at least one sub-question. And I'll take this um, as a presupposition. Okay? Another discourse property of the universal Do is that the associate exhausts the space of contextual uh, alternatives, uh, especially if though is stressed, which has been uh, also been observed by Ming Min. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, if you, the question is twenty two a, can Ami and Aku, Ami and Aku speak Japanese? And then it seems somewhat strange to answer by Ami and Ami do hui shuo ri. Right, so there are three individuals mentioned in the question, but then you answer only with two, and it sounds a little bit off. The uh, the source of infelicity seems to be that the expression, the subject, ame and ame, does not exhaust the space of alternatives. In other words, if we want to use do, we need to make sure that the associate of do exhausts all the alternatives that have been mentioned in the discourse. Okay. Um, one counterexample is something like this. Um, again, that's Domi Ming's example. Uh, in, for the same question, you can answer ame and ame do hui shuo ri. Right? So if you put stress on the associate, but not on Do, then this seems okay, right? So the 22A and 23A, they are the same QUDs, but then um, 22B is bad, well, 23B seems fine, again, with stress on the, the, the associate. And then this can be explained if stress pattern indicates a slightly different D tree, uh, where the universal Do quantifies over the sub-questions of just a subtree, for example, just this subtree in here, and it is still universal and exhaustive, right? So if though uh, ranges over the sub-questions right here, then we can still say that um, it's the, uh, the sub-questions exhaust all the relevant alternatives because we're only targeting this sub-question, right? Um, so, uh, the exhaustivity of Do uh, that the Do imposes on its associate is very similar to the effect independently observed for English alternative questions and alternative unconditionals. Um, so something like, are you making pasta or fish, right? With the, the following intonation, this English uh, sorry, alternative question <clears throat> implies that pasta and fish are the two only the only two relevant alternatives. So it would be infelicitous for one to respond by, no, I'm making the stew, right? Um, so are you making pasta or fish? Pasta and fish are just the only two uh, 
uh, relevant alternatives. There is nothing else, right? And then you can also observe the same effect on uh, what's called alternative unconditionals, right? So whether Alfonso has a cold or the flu, he should stay home from school. Okay, so here we're only con uh, concerned with whether he has a cold or the flu, uh, nothing else um, is relevant. Okay, so the generalization is that, um, first of all, for the sentence uh, with the universal do with associate, the associate introduces a set of sub questions such that all and only such sub questions constitute the domain uh, for the universal do. Okay, uh, in terms of D trees, uh, do quantifies over all and only the sub questions of a question node. Okay, whether the letter is a salient big question in the typical case or a sub question of a big question. So, for example, um, Do can target either this node or this node and imposes exactly the same restriction that uh, its associate exhausts all the alternatives um, in the, uh, the space of alternatives. Okay. Um, and then the uh, just like uh, Liu Mingming um, has observed, the exhaustivity effect is like a presupposition. So it can project in either conditionals or um, uh, questions. Okay, so for example, right? it sounds like only Amin and Amin are under discussion, right? <laughs> Right, so it sounds like only two salient individuals are under discussion. Okay, um, so here's a very uh, quick summary of though. First of all, it signals a sub-question based discourse structure. Um, it's a quantifier over sub-discourse sub-questions, but not over, uh, uh, over propositions. The advantage is that this can explain why it's perceived as universal, but can also co-occur with ordinary quantifiers such as every, okay? Um, due to the, mean, the the limit of time, I'm going to skip the uh, the remaining summarizing points, but then we can probably come back to this uh, later. Okay. Now I want to jump to the uh, scalar dough, which I label as uh, sigma dough. Uh, so this means the dough that has the even flavor, right? Lin amin dou bei shuo ri, ta li amin dou bu ren shi, right? So how, for example, uh, how do we go from the universal dough to the scalar dough in this framework of sub questions? Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions to ask. For example, what is the lien, uh, the lien in, in this construction, and why it is optional? <clears throat> how does the even like scalar reading come about? Okay, and then how can those associate be singular? Lien amin dou bei shuo ri, okay? Um, as many previous studies have, have observed, um, the sigma dou has universal force, but likely only contextually. So that means uh, it quantifies over something that is only present in the context, but not in the truth conditional semantics. Okay, so um, a sentence with this kind of dou can completely resolve a question through quantification at the pragmatic level, right? So if you ask who can speak Japanese, and then you can say, yinaming dou hui. Right, so it, it clearly it implies that everyone else can, and then you cannot you cannot keep uh, continue to ask, can Ami can Ami ask uh, speak Japanese? Can Ami ask uh, speak Japanese? Right, you cannot do that. <clears throat> um, likewise, uh, can can Ami can um, right? Can Ami speak Japanese? And then you say the Ami do hui, right? The Ami do hui. Then you, of course, you cannot continue to confirm. Can Ami speak Japanese, right? Can the students speak Japanese? And once again, if you use the Liendo construction, Ami do hui, right? Then you cannot continue to ask, na na Ami hui ma, right? So uh, compare these cases with 35, well, who can speak Japanese? And then if you just say Ami hui, um, then it's okay to continue to ask, na Ami na Ami hui ma, right? So what 32 to 34 show is that when, when we use the Liendo construction, it completely resolves the question under discussion and it's infelicitous to continue to ask um, a follow-up question, okay? Um, so that's our starting point. And I'm going to propose that um, the D tree, the discourse tree of 31A, for example, um, is something like 36, okay? Um, who can speak Japanese? That's the QUD, okay? And then, 
can Amin speak Japanese is the only sub question under this QUD, right? And then uh, this poll question is positive answer. Yes, Amin can speak Japanese, right? So this tree is different from <clears throat> the, the D tree of the universal though in that there is only one sub question for the QUD, um, but then it's also positively answered. So this simple tree is a special discourse strategy where the answer to the big question is fully provided by the answer to just one sub question. Okay, so how can this be? How can we use just one single sub question to completely resolve the super question? This is possible if the only sub question is inherently scalar. So it is least likely to have a positive answer among a set of potential sub questions, right? <clears throat> um, the positive answer to this sub question pragmatically implies the positive answer to all relevant sub questions. <laughs> this is the origin of the even like interpretation of Do uh, without anything defined as even lexically. So, in other words, we can revise the D tree in this way who can speak Japanese? Right. And then the only relevant sub question is Can Amin speak Japanese even though he is the least likely person who can? Right. So this even though part is given by the context. Right. So that means the speaker is using the strategy uh, where he answers the question that is least likely to be yes in order to completely resolve the QUD. Okay, um, so that's the that's the main idea, right? So that's the main idea between uh, main, the main difference between the universal though and the, uh, the the scalar though. For the universal though, there are multiple sub questions. Okay, for the the scalar though, for the even though, there is just one sub question. But then, due to the context uh, that can satisfy the relation between the super question and the sub question, the sub question has to be scalar. Uh, as supplied by uh, the context, okay. All right, and then um, I'm going to skip some more details, okay. Uh, maybe so I, I can show you the summary but between, uh, the summary that, that covers uh, both kinds of, of dough. 41 is the, the, the discourse structure for the universal dough. 42 is the discourse structure for the scalar, for the even-like dough. Right. Um, in both cases, the function of Do is to indicate that um, all sub questions have a positive answer. Okay, but the, the difference is that for the scalar Do, there is only one sub question. Okay. Um, okay, and then uh, let me now jump to the, the the final topic of today, which is the Zhou. Uh, uh, Right. So how do we extend this framework to this jiu, which indicates some kind of lowness? So <clears throat> lowness meaning that when we say two, uh, it seems to suggest that there is no need to get someone else who can speak Japanese, right? So it's like Amin is someone that we can easily find. There is no need to find someone else. The key intuition is that two is not simply an assertion about who can speak Japanese, okay? but rather it implies some kind of <clears throat> contextually relevant purpose or goal. Um, and the contribution of Zhou is that nothing other than the associate um, army is required to achieve the goal. Okay? So the, uh, the idea is that um, this sentence, okay, uh, army, army, <clears throat> takes not 45, but 45, not 45A, but 45B as its QUD. Who can speak Japanese and must we find? So this is a QUD that has a built-in necessity model uh, must in here, because this is a context where we're trying to ask a question in order to achieve a goal, in order to solve a problem. So the, the, the D tree uh, is actually this, right? The QUD is who can speak Japanese and must we find. The sub questions is again, a set of polar questions uh, like uh, can Ami speak Japanese and must we find him? Can Ami speak Japanese and must we find her, right? The um, uh, at issue content of Joe is that all the sub questions other than the one that is directly answered by the sentence are negatively answered. So yes for this sub question, but no for the other all other questions. Okay. 
right? So that's the that's the main idea. That Joe, um, first of all, requires that the sub questions have a necessity model, okay? And second, only the sub question, uh, only the first sub question, which is directly responded by the sentence with Joe, is positively answered. All other sub questions have a negative answer, so no and no, okay? Right, so in other words, uh, what the results that we get is that we don't have to find anyone other than Amin, okay? Can Amin speak Japanese and must we find him? Yes. Can Amin speak Japanese and must we find her? No, right? So this no answer does not really, does not have to negate Amin. Amin cannot speak Japanese, but rather it can negate this necessity modal proposition. Must we find her? No, we do not have to find her, even though she can also speak Japanese. Okay, so this explains why Joe is low, but it's non-exclusive. The sub-questions that are negatively answered have a necessity motive, and the no, the negative responses uh, can target the part that has the necessity motive, but not the first part, okay? Um, <clears throat> however, this Joe uh, is sometimes also exclusive. Okay, it can be non-exclusive, but it can also be exclusive. If we consider something like this, um, Sankara and Jolila. Okay, Sankara and Jolila. This sentence sounds out of the blue. Um, it sounds odd out of the, out of the blue without explicit context. But consider this, right? <clears throat> Suppose you're teaching a large class of 100 students. One of the requirements of the final project is that each group should meet you in person at least once. And then to keep things manageable, you ask the class to visit your office hours in group of five, okay, in groups of five. But today, only three students show up, right? So it, it would be okay to say, right? So maybe you can add something more like, okay? So this context involves the ontic necessity, which is the students must meet you in groups of five, okay? Um, and then 47 conveys the following. Three people came. So that's like the pre-Jason of Joe. But at the same time, it also conveys that students are required to meet you in groups of five or more. So that means 47 can be okay in a context where uh, some kind of necessity model in here, a deontic model is built in in this context. So once again, the relevant question on the discussion is not 49A, it's not just how many people came, but rather something like 49B. <clears throat> how many people came when five are required to come. So that is the true, true UD that 47 is trying to respond. And what's the discourse structure? Um, it has this QUD, and then it has, once again, a set of sub-questions, okay? Did three people came, uh, sorry, did three people come when five are required to come? Yes. And then all other sub-questions have a positive, uh, sorry, have a negative answer. Did four come when five are required to come? No, right, so no, no, no. <clears throat> the function of Joe is the same. So all sub questions other than the first one are negatively answered. Okay? But in this case, the QUD is not about what counts as enough for a goal. So it's different from the goal-oriented context in the beginning. But instead, it is like a standard quantity question, how many came, except that it also has a built-in deontic necessity model when five are required to come. <clears throat> so um, you can negate, you can uh, uh, negate sub-questions, the answers to the sub-questions in order to derive the lowness reading. But in this context, when, when you have negative answer to all these sub-questions, you also derive the exclusive reading because when you say Sanger and Jolila, right, it is not compatible in context where four people came and five people came. So it is lowness, uh, it indicates scalar lowness and exclusivity at the same time. And then this kind of framework can nicely capture uh, this fact, okay? My time is almost up, so uh, I'm going to jump over more examples, uh, more details, but then uh, you get the idea, right? So uh, uh, um, I have shown, right, I have shown a sub-question-based ana analysis of three particles, uh, two particles by three uses, okay? The universal dough, <clears throat> the scalar dough, the even dough, and the, the jiu, which indicates scalar lowness, which capitalizes on the parallelism between sentences containing these particles and sentences with contrasted topics. So semantically, we need a CT operator. 
Um, <clears throat> that is at the core of the formal analysis. Um, this is directly borrowed from Constance dissertation. The city, op city operator, um, as I, I uh, discussed earlier, is crucial in allowing us to derive the potent question meaning. Okay? And then we can further derive a set of potent questions from CT marking okay? or something similar to that uh, based on uh, uh, the derivation of a potent question. <clears throat> so uh, how do we compare all these three part <clears throat> these uses of the particles? <laughs> The universal dough requires that all sub questions be positively answered. The sigma dough, okay, the scalar dough requires that the positive answer to the only sub question implies the positive answer to all other questions. Okay. And finally, the, the, the joe that indicates scalar lowness requires that the sub questions are modalized by a necessity model. Okay. And only the one directly answered is positively answered. So, in other words, in this framework, all the, the particles, they operate on sub-questions, but then they impose different requirements on how the sub-questions should be answered. And also they impose different requirements on um, the form of the sub-questions. So in particular, Joe requires that the sub-questions must be modalized by a necessity model. Okay, So that's a major departure from previous literature in that I'm treating Do and Joe as uh, quantifiers over discourse sub-questions and not propositions. So in EFAG, um, the particles associate with CT but not with focus, okay? And then of course, there are many other uses of, of Do and Joe that I have not discussed today that I cannot, I, you know, I really don't have time for them. But at the same time, uh, this approach can be extended to other scalar particles in this language, such as Ye, such as Cai. Um, and high, um, and then there are many others in Mandarin and also in Cantonese as well. Okay, so that's it's like the starting of a long-term project for uh, that, that that you know many of us can sort of work together uh, uh, on that. Okay, so that's all for for the talk, and uh, thank you for.